Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, my, my talk today, uh, which is on the subject of enabling translation of biomarker research to clinical practice. Uh, my name is Fergus Fleming, and I am the Chief Technology Officer of Renalytics, uh, a, a clinical diagnostics company based out of UK and the US. I'm sitting here in Ireland, and uh, we have a technology center that uh, I operate from, from here in Ireland. So moving quickly along, I wanted to just uh, briefly go through the agenda of the items I want to cover today. I'll talk a little bit more about myself and my background so that we can get some context in terms of the perspective that I'm coming from in relation to this area of biomarker translation. Uh, we'll cover some of the key steps uh, involved in the in the journey from biomarker research to actual use in clinical practice. As many of you will know, there are many stakeholders involved in this cycle of development and translation, and we'll, we'll speak a little bit about uh, who all those stakeholders would be uh, and how and their different roles that they would play in enabling this, this translation. And then we'll wrap up with some uh, discussion on some key challenges and, and opportunities for how together we can uh, make some progress in, in advancing this translation to a, to a higher level. On the next slide, uh, speaking to myself, my background really is in the medical device and diagnostics industry. So I come from the, the industrial side of, of the actual design, development, manufacturing, and, 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 and supply of medical technology and diagnostics. I've developed in the last 10 years in particular quite a lot of experience in, in the development and, and translation of in vitro diagnostics across a number of uh, clinical spaces, uh, including hemostasis, coagulation, infectious diseases, and, and oncology. Recently, I've been spending a lot of time working on advanced diagnostics. These are diagnostics that bring together multiple biomarkers together with other uh, data science and data features, including advanced algorithms, uh, and ad addressing some specific needs in the area of, of diagnostics and the broader field of diagnostics, which we've discussed later on. In so doing, I've had a lot of interaction with digital health and the role that digital health plays in, in the current uh, clinical context, and also uh, traditional medical devices as well. My current role is with a company called Renalytics, which was founded in 2018 with the objective of converging and bringing the, advancing the convergence of biomarkers and data to address unmet needs, specifically in chronic kidney disease. So a lot of what we will speak about today is, is, is informed by that context. The specific purpose that we're trying to address right now in Renalytics is to use diagnostics and biomarkers to identify patients who are most at risk of disease progression. So these are patients who already have a condition, in this case, chronic kidney disease, where we're trying to discriminate between patients who would be most at risk for for progression and therefore who would most benefit from advanced care and advanced therapeutics. Our lead product is called Kidney Intellects and it's designed as part of an overall comprehensive solution for kidney health. So very briefly in relation to the product itself, uh, here we're, talking, we're taking three biomarkers that have been widely published in the literature, uh, specifically the soluble tumor necrosis factor one, soluble tumor across factor two, and kidney injury molecule one. But we're combining that with the data that's available in a patient's electronic health record to give us the best source of the contemporary clinical status of the patient and using a validated algorithm to translate all of that information into a piece of actionable uh, instruction. We provide that through a, a test report where we uh, communicate the risk profile of the patients in, in, in both a quantitative and qualitative uh, presentation, low, intermediate, and high risk of progression on a scale of 0 to 100. Notably, what we do is link that risk profile to, to a set of guideline-informed actions that the provider or the physician can take with that patient to try and advance uh, and, and, and preserve their kidney health. 
most of that is based on 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 established guidelines but in for those of you who may be familiar with chronic kidney disease there's been a lot of innovation and, and new developments in terms of therapies in this area and some of which have now been incorporated into clinical guidelines so we want to maximize the adherence to those clinical guidelines by sh by by highlighting where those new medications can best be used so that provides a general context for for a lot of what we will speak about later on in in, in the uh, in the talk. So what type of inform actionable information do biomarkers provide? Um, this is, you know, for those of us in the diagnostic industry, you know, one man's diagnostic is another man's prediction. So what we try to do is ensure that we are at the, at the very front of the translational pipeline, trying to understand what is the actionable information? What is it that the thing that somebody will do differently as a result of having that information available. And across the spectrum of the disease timeline, there are a number of different diagnostic tests where biomarkers would play a role. For example, in the absence of any disease or in the absence of any indications of disease, you have risk stratification or screening biomarkers. For example, uh, one of those would be uh, PSA for prostate cancer, where just because of age, uh, one might be encouraged to have a, a, a PSA test, which is a biomarker that is indicative of some level of risk for prostate cancer. Moving on, then you go to screening biomarkers, where now you've got some evidence of disease and now you want to screen the ones that are, are most likely to have the disease. Some of those would include things like cholesterol, right, where you have some level of um, risk factors now you measure cholesterol as a screening test to say, okay, who's, who's the, who are the patients who are, who are most likely to be uh, at most at risk for cardiovascular disease? Moving on to symptomatic disease, you're looking at your, your, your straightforward diagnosis. So you're ruling in or ruling out a condition using biomarkers. Some examples of those would be nt p which is a, a measure uh, of uh, an indicator of heart failure or potential for heart failure hospitalization. And we've translated into diagnosis, treatment decisions, and surveillance monitoring. We, in particular, in terms of kidney intellect, is very much in the prognostic area where patients already have a diagnosis, but now we're looking to see what is the prognosis for that patient? How do we differentiate a large population of patients into, into different risk strata based on a biomarker profile? That's uh, an area then that moves into knowing those patients have a risk profile. Now you want to ensure that they're, they're going to receive the appropriate care. That's where predictive biomarkers come into play, where now you want to know after that whether the right therapy is going to be picked for the right patient. This is often called com complementary diagnostics or companion diagnostics. Again, you're answering a specific question around a patient's risk and matching that risk to a particular therapy. And then moving on to using either the same biomarkers or different biomarkers to monitor the disease progression. And back to PSA, well, it is a reasonably contentious uh, test or biomarker for, for screening. It is actually quite an effective biomarker for, for monitoring of, a, of existing disease. So biomarkers play a significant role right across the spectrum. And at the very beginning of any biomarker translation process, which is something I will repeat quite a bit, is really having a clear understanding of what the, what the indicated use or the purpose or the, or the actionable information will be based on that biomarker or biomarker test. In terms of the very first point, and uh, a lot of you working in the research space will know that you know, lots of papers get published and lots of associations are identified where a biomarker is linked to a particular outcome. And outcome definition is very important and we'll speak a little bit about that later on as well. And one of the ways in which people will traditionally assess a biomarker against an outcome is looking at the area under the curve as, as a measure of, of performance. Once you get a reasonably high AUC and typically in, a, in an area discovery cohort, an AUC of, of, of 0.9 or better is typically something that would be classified as, as a, good, a good biomarker. 
Now you move on to it, say, okay, well, does it, does it really add value? Um, what are the things that will be reportable as a result of this biomarker? And you need to look at what this biomarker does in the presence of various other uh, clinical features. So you're using things like odds ratios, risk ratios, hazard ratios to, to, to bring this biomarker into, into a context in relation to other clinically uh, relevant features. If it doesn't pass that test, then it's just informative in terms of it, it has an association, but it's unlikely to be helpful in terms of adding new information upon which people can make decisions. If that's not the case, and you do have clinically significant uh, discrimination of, of value, where this biomarker is adding new information, now you've got something that you can move into uh, the next realm of, of investigation. So now you've got a quantifiable improvement in, in, in the information available from this biomarker. And that really is the first discovery or early uh, publications that would emerge from, from a biomarker research program. However, a single, evidence, a single piece of evidence around a biomarker is rarely enough to, to support not only the, the, the endeavor required to move it further along the development pipeline, but also the significant level of investment required. So, so what you're looking for in in, a, in good in, in the context of really good biomarkers are ones that have been extensively studied and extensively validated. This is a busy slide, but it's just a, as a way of indicating that in the case of the biomarkers used in our particular use case, um, they have been extensively studied by many researchers across the globe and have consistently been demonstrated to be highly prognostic for disease progression in chronic kidney disease. So we didn't need to depend on one paper or two papers or one study or two studies. We were able to leverage quite a depth of literature, which comes from early engagement and early enthusiasm from some of the world-class clinical researchers and, and biomarker researchers who, who saw the early publication and, and took it upon themselves in collaboration with others to to expand the data, the data set around these biomarkers, which ultimately led to them being able to be translated into clinical practice. Having gone through that stage of development, which is really a, a feasibility and a credibility phase, we've been able to demonstrate uh, that these biomarkers truly add independent information over existing clinical features. Lots of studies have been done to demonstrate that they have both biological and clinical relevance, um, and there's evidence to support that. Importantly, as I mentioned on the previous slide, replication and validation across multiple cohorts with multiple ethnicities represented in those cohorts. And very importantly, that there is a very defined and verifiable set of outcomes that the biomarkers are being tested against. Whether that's in, in, in the case of chronic kidney disease, that's really you're you're really trying to ensure that there is a consistency in terms of what the biomarkers are being associated with. In chronic kidney disease, the hardest outcome, or the outcome that's most uh, measurable, I guess, and and, and and indisputable, is where a patient has moved on to end stage renal disease requiring dialysis or transplantation. However, that can take quite a lot of time, and therefore, in a lot of disease conditions, and particularly in chronic kidney disease, you look for surrogate outcomes. And in surrogate outcome for, for end-stage renal disease, in, in our case, would be a progression in, in, in kidney function decline. So you're looking for a measurable decline in kidney function over a defined period of time, which is indicative of the, that patient's risk of moving on to uh, the catastrophic event of end-stage renal disease. So having really clearly defined and verifiable outcomes is very important in this uh, translation journey. Then the practicalities kick in, in terms of you know, what is the sample? How accessible is it? And can it be handled in a way that will allow the analyzer, the biomarkers, to be measured 
repeatedly and reproducibly. Um, sample types are, are many. You know, you'll be familiar, obviously, with things like urine and plasma serum. Also, you have uh, tumor tissue samples and other biopsy uh, derived uh, sample types that are used in biomarker research and biomarker translation. In our particular case, we're looking at predominantly serum and urine in, in the chronic kidney disease space, or sorry, plasma and urine. Uh, right now, we're looking, uh, we're measuring our biomarkers in plasma, uh, but we have to make sure that we understand how stable is the analyte in that uh, medium, how stable is it during handling and transport, transportation, and then ultimately, what level of standardization is available to make sure that once we measure those biomarkers, that we can do so repeatedly and reproducibly, and, and, and one measure will be um, the same. The same the measurement will be the same day in, day out. And then, as I mentioned previously, understanding the actionable information and what the clinical need is must be clearly defined before you move beyond this early stage of, of biomarker translation. So having Having addressed all of those criteria, the next step really then is to is to move into the product development, the cycle of development, and then making sure that that development is executed in accordance with the relevant regulatory frameworks. In this new world of, of AI-derived models, AI algorithms, it, in our case, a, a combination of an AI algorithm with biomarkers, not only do you have the the traditional regulatory frameworks of US FDA, European Medicines Agency marking, uh, and laboratory standards such as CLSI and, and CLIA, you also have um, data security and privacy considerations. So everything we do and the software that underpins some of the work that we do in terms of developing these biomarker tests uh, must be developed and validated in accordance with those regulations and personal security and data security and, and integrity is, is, is paramount in, in all of these situations. Given that context, what is clear is what the, the beginning of any translational process is really understanding the requirements. What are they, what is the, the test or what is the biomarker application that you're really focused on? And I'm going to speak a little bit about that on the next slide, but I, I want to stress that that's uh, really the, the the secret to success here is in in making sure that again with the multiple stakeholders involved that we have a clear understanding of what it is we're trying to address. Will it have an impact? Will it provide information that is going to be actionable? And documenting and ca capturing those requirements is key. In, uh, in having done so, then you've got to focus on the asset. You want to know that you can measure these biomarkers. You've got to go through your asset development cycle, uh, you know, picking your platform, picking your asset reagents, and making sure you have all of those crit critical reagents available that you can bring into a regulated framework. If there's an algorithm, you've got to develop and train that algorithm in large data sets and derive the cutoffs that you're going to use for the diagnostic test. Cutoffs being the differentiation between disease, no disease, low risk, high risk, whatever the particular suitable for a therapy or not suitable for a therapy, depending on what are those uh, use cases, the, cut, the, the requirement for cutoffs will be different. And more, more often than not, all of these diagnostic tests today and biomarker tests today involve software. So whether that's software that's embedded in, in an existing laboratory instrument or a software portal that's used to, to generate an algorithmic derived risk score, all of that needs to be, again, developed, controlled, and, and validated. As, and then you move through the, the cycle of validation. I won't go through all of that in great detail, but you, I, I do want to emphasize that there are guiding principles there for all of these uh, steps from, from the regulatory agencies, and specifically in relation to analytical validation, we're very fortunate to have very clear guidelines provided by the CLSI, and I have a slide later on that kind of highlights some of those guidelines around analytical validation. But the same applies for software validation and, and clinical validation, which you then ultimately ex you execute to provide the, the, the objective evidence 
that your biomarker test is doing what it says it purports to do. So are you, are you providing the information that you are claiming that the, the biomarker can do? And then you move through your regulatory processes and ultimately into clinical impact and utility assessment. So just to dig into a little bit, briefly go to a, a little bit more detail in some of those uh, requirements gathering. Uh, an important thing is, uh, again, the clinical use case, what is the intended use? What is the, what is the information that the biomarker is, is going to provide? And what sort of performance expectations are, are, are govern the use of this test? And those performance expectations can include things like sensitivity, absolute risk, specificity, etc. At this point, one always thinks about risk. What is the risk of, of this biomarker uh, giving the wrong information that could result in incorrect treatment decisions? So that that is, is something that you want, must consider very early in the process so that you immediately begin to start to mitigate those risks as you go through the uh, validation process. Indicated use is slightly different. Uh, in that in indicated use is for it defines the, the, the patient profile that it, the test is going to be used on. And again, this is something that needs to be very clearly defined. Is it is it depending on whether it's a screening test, a diagnostic test, or a, a, a companion diagnostic? Understanding what is the entry level, if you like, for, for the test um, is very important. And that can be based on clinical characteristics, disease stage stages or, or patient demographics. We talked a little bit about the sample, how it will be handled. An important point here is the clinical context of use will, will, will inform the tar target turnaround time. So knowing whether that biomarker result needs to be made available to the physician in an ICU to make a decision around a, a, a potential sep a sepsis situation is completely different to something that will be used to as a as a prognostic test for a chronic condition like uh, CKD, where a five day turnaround time might be sufficient, where in the case of an ICU situation in, in the case of sepsis, a five hour turnaround time is probably too long. So you're looking at completely different conditions of of how the biomarker will be measured and deployed in clinical practice. A lot of work goes into figuring out how you're going to measure it, and, and sometimes a lot of the research work that's done that, that initially is involved in the discovery of the, of the biomarker may not be something that can be used in clinical practice. Therefore, you need to have a translation of, of the assay method from, from a research method into a, to a fully regulatable uh, and, 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 and commercially available platform. So that, that includes the instruments itself, the reagents that are used, and the availability of any reference standards or calibrators that may be needed in, in, in executing the test. Understanding how the test will be presented, how the test result will be presented. Is it a single measurement? Uh, you know, is it a single biomarker that will be reported out against a, a, a global cutoff, for example? Troponin I, uh, which is used to, to rule it as a, as a test in the emergency unit for patients presenting with chest pain or potential um, heart attack, it has a, a, a well known internationally established cutoff for whether a patient is truly in encountering a heart attack or whether it's just a, a, a non -symptom a symptomatic chest pain. So in some biomarkers, you will have the, the luxury of a global cutoff. Other times, you, you don't, and you have to establish those cutoffs. In our case, we establish a cutoff through our algorithm training cycle, where we, where we established a, a set of uh, criteria where we wanted to put a certain number of the patient population into low risk and a certain number of the population into high risk, and we define our cutoffs accordingly, which is based on a probability of an event occurring. So again, without getting into the specifics, one needs to consider what cutoffs are required, how many cutoffs are required. Is it a single rule in or rule out? Is it a, is it a binary test or is there multiple uh, categories that are going to be reported? 
and whether you will use a, 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 a cutoff at all or whether you will just provide a, a continuous risk score on a, on a continuous scale. Thereafter, once you've addressed those uh, many questions, then you can start to, to plot your way towards regulatory approval and, and commercial implementation. So very briefly to, to touch on, and uh, I'm not sure whether the slides would be available to you, but uh, you know there are we do have the the availability of of very good standards around guiding this activity, and as I mentioned, the the availability of the CLIA, sorry, the CLSI guidelines um, for for analytical validation are are really the go-to uh, references for for how to conduct analytical validation. So then maybe to touch on uh, the importance of, of dissemination and publication. And in our case, you know, all of the work that we've done, both in terms of analytical validation on the bottom right-hand corner uh, to clinical validation on the left-hand side, all of that data is, is, is made available to the, to the users of the, of the test through, through publication and dissemination and through all the regulatory uh, literature that we, we would create. But most early adopters in particular will, will refer to the, uh, to the peer-reviewed publications that underpin uh, the, the biomarker test itself. I mentioned the, the, you know, the multiple stakeholders that are involved in biomarker development and translation. Um, a number of people on, uh, in, in, in this event will, will, will be participants in, in, the, in, this, uh, in this area. Academic and clinical research is really where a lot of this begins. A lot of the biomarker discovery work is done in academic and clinical research centers around the globe. Uh, we're fortunate to work with some leading researchers in that area, including Jocelyn Diabetes Center, the University of Michigan, and the University of Medical Center of Kroningen. It's important to stress the importance of our partners in, 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 in the pharmaceutical and diagnostics industry, without which there would not be uh, the level of development and translation of biomarkers we have today. Uh, we work with, with, with a number of those, namely uh, Janssen and AstraZeneca in, in certain respects, but we also work with diagnostics manufacturers such as Biotechni and Mesoscale in, in developing the, our platforms. But what pharma and diagnostics companies bring is, is A, clearly defined needs. They also help to bring uh, biobanks and samples uh, that can help to, to not only develop but to validate biomarkers, and obviously to bring the expertise in the development of the critical materials that are required to, to allow these uh, biomarkers get into clinical practice. As, as biomarkers move into the into the clinical practice, then you need to develop real world evidence that there are, these tests are beginning to have an impact. We uh, put a lot of emphasis on that through this whole new paradigm that people hear about all the time around real world data translating into real world evidence. And we, we're executing a number of real world evidence studies in the US across multiple health systems on thousands of patients to, to demonstrate in real world over time, the impact that these new biomarkers can have on informing clinical care. Lastly, you've got the advocacy groups, National Kidney Foundation, uh, patient, patient groupings, American Diabetes Association, all of which have a shared interest in making sure that these new therapies, and, uh, sorry, new, new biomarker tests and new information is made available to patients as, as expeditiously as possible. Uh, without their support and without their um, guidance to some extent, uh, you will ultimately not be able to change clinical practice. So, you know, obviously the key role for some of these organizations is in, in, in outlining guidelines and, and uh, you know, they're con constantly reviewing and updating guidelines based on evidence to support new, new medical technologies, new diagnostics and new therapies. So they're, they're very much a, a partner or a, or a stakeholder in, in, in this overall translation. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this slide other than to echo what many people uh, will, will say, in that the earliest 
involvement or the earliest engagement of all the stakeholders in a development process, the better. And this uh, schema here speaks specifically around the development of a companion diagnostic or in the area of precision medicine, where you're looking for a specific biomarker test that will inform a specific therapy to be used on a particular patient. The key point here is earlier, earliest engagement, the better, where both the, the diagnostic or the biomarker and but our biomarkers and the therapeutic are being developed along the same pipeline. So then to wrap up with some, some key challenges and opportunities, many of which I will have touched on already. Um, one is early engagement and partnership uh, is critical. I think it, it, is a, it is a convergence of data, diagnostics, biomarker research, pharmaceutical uh, development, precision medicine, patient centers, uh, medicine, all of these things bring together the opportunity for early engagement in partnership and making sure that all of this excellent biomarker research does actually get translated to the patient at the end of the day. From a, from a, re a regulatory point of view, again, the same principle applies. The earlier the engagement, the better. Um, so it is very important that as, as we begin to look at the role of these biomarkers in clinical practice that we we try to make sure that they are developed in accordance with the regulatory requirements and, and having that early involvement in terms of understanding the risk benefit equation is very important. For, uh, access to retrospective biobanks and linked data sets is, is really, really critical. A lot of people around the globe are now developing disease registries, which is which is fantastic. Uh, Randomized controlled trials have, have been a, 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 a very fruitful um, source of, of biobanks and, and, and biospecimens linked to data, all of which can not just serve to fill the gap in terms of biomarker discovery, but also in terms of biomarker validation. So use of these biobanks, the generation of real world evidence, biobanks and disease registries, all serve to to advance the ability to translate these biomarkers into clinical practice. The next, and finally, just to reiterate that, you know, in today's world, you can't get away from the data boom, if you, if for want of a better word, and, and the ability to access data and the ability to incorporate that data into advanced analytics and advanced algorithms together with the, with the contemporary biology coming from the biomarkers really serves to 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 advance the whole area of precision medicine so that's that's no different in oncology than it is in chronic conditions uh, such as chronic kidney disease and i think that is something that is going to herald significant innovation as it has already done so but even i think that's going to even be accelerated uh, in the years to come so with that i just wish to uh, thank everybody for listening and uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the event. And if anybody wanted to reach out to me, I'm available at the email address showing on, on the screen right now. Uh, thank you very much.